Okay, I'm going to finish up with Callot's introduction now, coming really back to his introduction of these major issues and just things to kind of keep in the back of your mind as um, we are talking about this biological approach to understanding behavior and thought. Now, the biological explanations of behavior fall into four major categories. Uh, the first one Callot mentions is physiological. So we will, I think, a lot of the time we will be giving these kinds of physiological explanations where really we're relating behavior, thought, and so forth to the activity of the brain and other organs. So really this includes anything from um, discussing brain anatomy, uh, anything about the nervous system, the release of neurotransmitters, hormones, all of that. An ontogenetic explanation of behavior describes the development of a structure or behavior. And this, so this can include, this can include those physiological explanations, uh, genetic background, but it, it, it also includes things like environment and so how, um, how we develop really psychologically. And we can oftentimes an ontogenetic explanation can be uh, going from conception uh, to death. Uh, they have evolutionary explanations of behavior where really what we're doing is reconstructing evolutionary history of a behavior or structure or these kind of ancestral relations of who and what we are related to. And Callot distinguishes the evolutionary explanation from, func from functional explanations. And this is kind of important. So a lot of us, I think, think of functional explanations as evolutionary, and they are sort of couched under that because of our explanations of evolution is that um, we have particular features or structures that are adaptive that allow us to survive and reproduce, and so they allow for natural selection. But really, when we're talking about those adaptive features and the functions of those features, this is a functional explanation. So this just functional explanations describe why a structure or behavior evolved as it did. How did it give us this adaptive advantage? Uh, Callot walks us through these biological explanations, um, giving an example of each one using bird song. And I like songbirds, so I love I love these examples. Uh, so a physiological explanation of um, songbirds and their songs might be that a particular area of the songbird brain grows under the influence of testosterone. So this explains why it's larger in breeding males than in females or in immature males. And so this is clearly purely physiological, this influence of testosterone influencing a region of the brain. An example of an ontogenetic explanation uh, for birdsong, in many species, young males learn their song by listening to adult males. So development of the song requires certain genes and the opportunity to hear the appropriate song during a sensitive period in early life. And we will talk, uh, I'm pretty sure, during in um, neural development about these kinds of sensitive periods and critical periods. And so once we start adding uh, any kind of um, environmental, any kind of experience that we need, and we're adding that to some of these physiological explanations, we're getting into a more kind of, I think of it as a more holistic explanation. That's an ontogenetic explanation. And here's this distinction between the evolutionary explanation and the functional explanation. Again, where the evolutionary explanation is really more uh, historical, talking about these evolutionary relationships and the functional is giving us what's what's the function um, really, or what, what did this give us as far as uh, adapting and surviving. So the evolutionary explanation for birdsong, if we look at specifically Dunlins and Baird's sandpipers, they have similar songs which are distinct from other species in the same area. And this suggests that they evolved from a single ancestor. So you can see it's just kind of a historical, who are my ancestors? Who am I more closely related to? We can see this kind of evolutionary history. And the functional explanation, or a functional explanation, uh, in most bird species, only the males sing. He sings only during the reproductive season. 
and only in his territory. The functions of the song are to attract females and to warn away other males. As a rule, a bird, a bird sings loudly enough to be heard only in the territory he can defend. So basically, birds evolved tendencies to sing in ways that improve their chances for mating. Okay, really giving them the territory, giving them the attraction of females. This is the, right, this kind of natural selection. What is going to make me more likely to reproduce? And one more example, um, because it comes with this really neat picture of a sea dragon. Uh, this is an Australian fish related to the seahorse. It lives among kelp plants. It looks like kelp, and it usually drifts slowly and aimlessly, so it kind of acts like kelp. And so that we are, again, uh, really distinguishing that functional explanation from an evolutionary explanation. The functional explanation is, as with many, many, right, of, of these camouflage animals, that they are camouflaged because that means potential predators are going to overlook this animal because this fish looks like inedible plants. An evolutionary explanation is that um, genetic modifications expanded smaller appendages that were present in these fish's ancestors. So really, again, just a description of historically what happened, evolutionarily what happened. The very final part of the introduction from Callet and this kind of major issue, major background issues to consider before moving on uh, is the use of animals in research. And I think this is a really important discussion to have and topic to think about uh, sort of what your, your feelings are. Um, animal research is a really important source of information uh, for various fields and certainly for biological psychology as we talk about uh, even the really the background of how the nervous system works, most of that we learned by first looking at animals. This is still a really highly controversial topic. Um, my background is that as, as an undergraduate, I would not have taken this class because I was so uncomfortable listening to some of the, the research has, that has been done. But uh, as I've grown older, not only have I just read a lot more of it and um, become somewhat more comfortable with it, um, but I realize uh, it's the importance of um, how much we can learn by examining animals. Uh, animal research does vary in the amount of stress and or pain that is caused to the animal itself. Your author goes through a number of reasons for animal research or why we might examine animals instead of people. Uh, the first is that the underlying mechanisms of behavior are really quite similar across species. Uh, an animal model works for many, many questions, and it's often easier to study uh, some of these mechanisms of behavior in non-human species than in, in humans. And so it's not just the mechanisms of behavior, but this kind of the ner a nervous system is a nervous system is a nervous system. And so if a nervous system behaves a certain way, we can extrapolate to um, how a human nervous system works. And I usually use the example of as really learning theorists uh, utilizing oftentimes rats or mice or pigeons that they are studying something like conditioning and they can completely control the lifetime of that animal so that they know what background that animal has. Whereas when a person comes in to be a participant in their study, we don't know uh, the background of that person or whatever previous conditioning they have that we're either working with, with some of our participants or working against with other participants. So it's often just easier to um, clearly examine these mechanisms of behavior in non-human species. Other reasons for animal research or examining non-human species? Well, we are interested in animals for their own sake. And this is not just people from other fields, um, like veterinarians, biologists, ethologists. Uh, this includes people in psychology. So there is a growing field of animal cognition, and those people are interested in how those particular animals uh, think and how they communicate. I find it's actually a very interesting field. 
Also, what we learn about animals sheds light on our evolution. And there are some experiments that cannot use humans because of legal or ethical reasons. And you might ask, well, why does that allow us to use animals? But I'm going to go through of how um, really important some of these questions are and how profound the implications and not just for uh, making human life better, but we can extrapolate that uh, where veterinarians can use this information like learning about cancer to help animals live um, better lives and longer lives. If you go to the APA website, so that's the American Psychological Association website, you can quickly find their page of ethical principles. And you click into that page and you get 10 specific ethical standards, which I actually think of as more overarching standards, because when you click into one of those, let's say number eight um, on research and publication, they are giving you many uh, ethical guidelines and standards for um, if you are doing research and publishing that research in the field of psychology. 8.09 uh, discusses the ethics of animal research. And one of the main pieces of this is that colleges and research institutions in the United States are required to have an IACUC, so an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. And this committee oversees and determines acceptable procedures. So if I'm a researcher doing research on animals, I'm going to write up my my questions, my possible answers, my goals for looking at this and the procedures that I'm using, and they're gonna say, um, is this acceptable? There are at least three members on this committee, and you can see that um, the first is a veterinarian. So this is somebody who is an animal advocate. The second is a practicing scientist who is familiar with the goals and procedures of animal research, but is not doing the specific research that they are looking at right now. So. I have to be unaffiliated and objective about the research that I am determining whether or not it's acceptable. Uh, but this person knows really how animal research works. And a community member who is unaffiliated with the institution. And typically this community member is somebody um, whose background is really in ethics. So sometimes they use members of the clergy. As I was saying, for each study, an extensive protocol is submitted. So how the animals are going to be cared for, the procedures of the study are explicitly uh, laid out, how animals are going to minimize distress. So if they need to, they might use analgesics or anesthetics. And then if and how that animal will be euthanized at the end of the study. They're also required to justify the research ensuring that it has not already been done and that the research is important. So this justification of the importance of the research is not only a bit more stringent than what we see for um, human research, but also that, that it has not already been done. So um, with much of our human research, we want to replicate a particular study. We wanna see that we get the same results another time to make sure that it's a real result, right, as we're dealing with these uh, statistics and probabilities. So um, replicating is something we do often with human research, but people who are doing animal research, they really have to replicate with extension. They cannot just replicate research. They have to make sure that this has not already been done. The IACUC, the Institution Animal Care and Use Committee, they monitor the care and the treatment of the animals inspecting the labs every six months. So there are specific guidelines for care and treatment. And the IACUC will come in. And if the researchers are not following those guidelines, they can close the lab down for some amount of time um, until they get the lab back up to um, back up to par what they're supposed to be doing. Also part of the guidelines of um, the ethics of, of animal research include the three R's. So replacement, refinement, and reduction. Replacement uh, researchers should find alternatives for using animals whenever possible. So if we can do computer simulations, if we can look at uh, tissue samples and tissue growth, we're going to do that instead of using animals. Refinement researchers need to modify 
experimental procedures and other aspects of animal care so that they are minimizing or eliminating distress altogether. And finally, the reduction. Uh, animals, I'm sorry, researchers adopt experimental designs and procedures such that they require the fewest animal subjects possible. If I can do something looking at three rats, then I don't need to use 10 or 15. Again, this is a highly controversial topic, and it has been for decades. So when I was at the University of Illinois, uh, I was studying language, but I was on this wing that used to be the animal research wing back in the 60s. And so we were, we were behind these thick doors that had combination locks because they had uh, let the animals out at, at some point. Um, opposition varies a great deal from people who are more like minimalists who favor firm regulation on research and are thinking or considering really the type of animal that's being used and the amount of stress uh, that we're putting that animal through or those animals through to abolitionists who maintain that all animals have the same rights as humans and any use of animals is unethical. And when the scientists are uh, sending their justification to the IACUC, that justification shows an explicit consideration, uh, a weighing of this amount of benefit gained, uh, what we're learning, what are the implications, compared to the amount of distress that the animal or animals might be experiencing given the procedures. And there's really no clear dividing line, which is why we have these committees that uh, really have to pour over some of these studies to say, is this, is this justified? Again, because there's no clear dividing line, we probably all feel pretty differently about this. And um, if anybody wants me to put a discussion out on Blackboard, you want to rant in one direction or another, uh, that's, that is fine with me. I'm happy to do that, but I'll forget to do it unless someone asks me most likely. So I have a couple of websites here for more information. The one from the National Institute of Health. So this is this is kind of void, but I keep it on here to remind me to talk about it. They, this is the training website, and they used to let us into this, at least to the what you're supposed to read, the not the actual training testing, but what you're supposed to read is background before doing the training and testing. Um, if you're going to be working with animals and it's really quite extensive. They have to pass some pretty rigorous tests before they are allowed to to uh, do research on animals. It's it, for me as a person who does not do research on animals. I found it overwhelming and thought I'm not going to I'm not going to look through all this, but they're required to. OK, and the APA guidelines as well. Uh, so this ethical conduct when doing animal research. Uh, so we have lots of guidelines for care and um, lots of training, much more than any of us get for our domesticated animals or how we're treating our own animals, believe me. And then this really proponent of uh, animal research. If we stop animal research, then who's gonna stop really the, the real killers? Okay, this is my last slide for Wednesday. So uh, I will just end it here and say, see you on Friday, and I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, do think about asking questions or having a conversation on Monday about anything you, you want to.